This is where we left off internal and external motivations. There are five intrinsic motivators. There's a bazillion, but here are the five primary ones. We've got curiosity. And again, curiosity is the first step out of reactivity. So when our dogs are becoming reactive, we want to do whatever we can to find a way to get them curious because that's the path to recovery, curiosity. Then there's mastery, which is the natural drive. We, we talked a little bit about that, the genetics, how to tap into the genetics to create drive. There's the autotelic capabilities, the self-rewarding. Linda, you found this and spades just recently with Breezy having wanted to find probably a squirrel or a rabbit or a coyote scent. You saw firsthand number two, the drive. That's that's her drive. She's got to seek out and destroy <laughs> whatever that smell was. Her only mission in the world was that, right? So yeah. I, I love it that you were able to see that firsthand. She was she was like frenetic about it, right? You know what we started doing is we started. Um, playing hide and seek with her, like either hiding in a closet or even hiding her toy and she'll sniff it out and find it. And she just, she won't give up till she does. So and we are using that in a, in a playful way to have fun with her. So you're tapping in just exquisitely to her natural drive to seek and destroy. Uh, good on you. I love it. And then putting it into a game. The So that is a large part of you doing the work to raise her mood state from cranky crotchety to wahoo, let me find that thing so I can kill it, whatever, you know. She doesn't say that, but she's got the pictures, seek and destroy, right? Good on you. Can I can I add something to that? Please do. Um, just, just an idea, um, Linda. Um, yeah. One thing that I've taught Shane, and he's definitely caught on, and he's caught on well, although his nose isn't super good, we play search and I do it um, right now. I'm just doing it pretty much with his food when I feed him. So I get his food ready and um, he has to sit and I put, put it, move it under his nose and I say, smell, smell. So he's he learning the word smell. So he smells it. He knows he's not supposed to eat any. Then I, I tell him to stay and I, you know, somewhere on the first floor and he's getting really good at stays in the house. So he'll stay for a pretty long time now. And I go hide it somewhere. And okay. then, then I come back to him and he had to learn the word search, but he picked it up pretty fast. <laughs> and I, I said, search. And I, I go around in different quarters of the house with my finger pointing down search, search. So he gets the idea that he has to be searching around and then now he's definitely getting the idea, but I want to be able to lead him because I've always wanted to have a search and rescue dog. I'm sure I'll never do it. But um, so anyway, so he has to search for his food and, um, you know, that's what they have to do in the wild. So it's not like you know, terrible or anything. So anyway, yeah, I can try that. You, I you're, you're also teaching delayed gratification, which is crucial for impulse control. You're doing so many things with that game kudos to you nice i wouldn't have to tell her to search she she would go find the food <laughs> <laughs> but i will try that that's an even better game <laughs> thank you good on you and then autonomy we had to learn through our bomb detection dogs helping our bomb detection dogs seek find it find it find it you know the pointing and the insist assisting we had to do a very 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 fine balance of assisting before and stopping before it became interrupting right so we're assisting the dog to do whatever their natural drive is in inclined to do and we have to be mat become more and more masters that we are at determining what is perfect assist amount of assistance and when do i need to draw back from the assistance reason being if we get to a point where we we do too much assistance, 
then it's no longer self-perceived control. They give up their perceived control to you. And then they no longer have that maximum drive. So that's a fine teeter that you're always going to play with, especially that wonderful game of seek, find, or search, whatever it is. I I love that game. I don't play it as much anymore with my with Maui, but I would have a piece of cheese that I would I would uh, mark the ground for a twenty minute pathway. He would he he worked up to the point of twenty minutes to finding that cheese piece of cheese wow. in the middle of a tree inside the tree bark because <laughs> he was determined. But it started precisely where you are. You start with little baby steps, do a lot of help initially, seek, 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 whatever. And then increase, like you do any type of bubble work, increase the distance, increase the duration. Yeah, good on you. And then there's ex uh, external stimuli. We, we all know that stuff. Now, with anything, there's always... The, the uh, polarities, the positive trigger and the negative trigger. We're always looking for the positive triggers, and you're all you 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 guys are becoming masters at it. Phyllis, you have the blanket. He's his blank. He sees the blanket or the leaves. Those are triggers. He puts it in his mouth. He self soothes because he knows something's going to happen when he sees one of these two things. Um, the same uh, with you guys. Finding the positive and knowing the negative. Knowing the negative trigger. Okay, I, I see a dog coming. How far can I let this dog get to me before, you know, seeing the distance decrease? Mastering the negative triggers by raising the mood state. You guys are also mastering the art of raising your dog's mood state. Each of you is. Each of you is mastering this, so kudos to you. The role of curiosity in play, just mentioned that. Curiosity is crucial. First step out of reactivity or preventing reactivity. So there's three conditions to the flow state. There's setting clear objectives, motivations, and journaling. All that stuff that I showed you all up front is the first part, the first phase of flow. The first phase of flow, as you can see right here, is a bit of a struggle. You have to do the journaling. You have to find the triggers. You not only have to find them, but you have to write them down. And then from there, you wrote the temporary measure. What am I going to do temporarily work while I'm working on the permanent measure? It's work. It's it's struggle. You you were learning to provide immediate feedback. The timing is crucial, and it was hard. We we make we have and we will make mistakes about timing, the proper cue, reward in the proper reward, and then the learning. Learning, we have you guys have gone through a lot of the learning process. Get in all the details, the this, the that, and the when to do it. Learning will always occur, especially at the beginning when it feels just so arduous, but it'll also occur as you're exploring your uh, your flow states. So there's the, the balancing the challenges with the dog skills and the creativity. That's the all these three conditions for flow to occur are happen in the first phase, the struggle. The second phase, which you guys have experienced, is the release. Okay, let's let go of what we know and allow it to happen. We've released all the, the brain work, all the details, because they're all in there. And we've allowed our brain to access the information for us 
So we could achieve the state of flow. When we're thinking, we break out of the flow. When we go back into our details, so you guys are in the process of learning, okay, I had a hiccup, the dog was startled, we broke our micro flow. Because you know so much, because you're able to do pattern recognition up here during all the struggle, the positive triggers and the negative triggers, you're able to get right back into your flow. So you're able to experience a, a micro flow moment here and then come back to maybe a little bit of the struggle release. So here's here's where you're going in and out of, weaving in and out of. Yes, Linda. Yeah, so that is exactly what happened the other day. Uh, take The other night, I took Breezy out for a walk and everything was good. We were just bopping around. And then I saw my neighbor, who she doesn't like much, come home. And so she sort of froze up a little bit. And I'm like, you know, what do I going to do? And I just said, um, this way. And we went away. And then they, you know, they were still in their car. So I said, this way. And we then we went right by the neighbor back to our house. So just avoided the whole thing. So, like, we were in a good flow. Then that happened so i reacted and and distracted her and then we went right back to being okay excellent excellent see how everything is just coming into play like frosting on a cake smooth <laughs> smooth apple. and then we have recovery so when you and breezy got back from your walk you she learned a lot you learned a lot but you don't know what you learned yet because your thinking brain wasn't active. So the process of recovery is where we bring in, could bring in passive flow. Uh, yes, passive flow. You come in from that experiential walk, you put her in her crate, you sit right next to her with your meditation moment, long deep breathing, five minutes maybe. And that is when the super learning occurs. That for five minutes with nothing happening, the brain is reorganizing itself. The nervous system is reorganizing itself. She's registering everything that occurred. You're registering everything that occurred. So you're creating a pattern. You do it next time. Now you come back to the recovery and these neural pathways are becoming stronger and stronger and stronger because you've done this repetitiously over and over. You're creating the patterns. This is what happens. This is how we did it. And then next time when there's a more dastardly interruption to your flow, you will instantly go into that pattern even though it's a more dastardly interruption, like a, a car crash in front of you. Naturally, you might not be able to go right back into your flow, but you will be able to avoid panic. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'll start more meditation. So Ooh. hard to clear your mind. <laughs> but the yeah. counting helps. Counting backwards helps. That's what helped me quite some time ago and still to this day. When my teacher gave me that gift, she count backwards from 100. I never knew it was so hard. I would lose track every 10, <laughs> I swear. Not because I'm a retard and can't count backwards, because the thought would come up and it would wipe away, which is a perfect example. When we are counting backwards, we have to be in our flow. We can only think about that one thing, that one focus. And then we can see, experience, okay, this thought just knocked me out of the flow. I forgot yes. what I was doing. Yes. Right? Or sometimes we get so into it, we just drift off, and then we're like, oh, wait a minute. What number was I on? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a perfect practice of getting into the flow, the passive flow. Good so, idea. Lori, Lori, are you saying that, like, if Carrie walks with me out back and Shane's barking at him, he's Shane's on the leash like you told me to do, and Shane's barking at him, and maybe by the end of the five minutes, Shane's calmed down. 
And then, then we walk another five minutes. I let Shane off and then we come in. Are you saying that after that I should take him in and do the quiet time? That would be the, uh, the peak performance learning time. Okay. Yep. yep. Even, even oh, though, he, even though he messed up a lot, I mean, not that, I mean, even though he, he will learn wasn't... how he messed up. Uh huh. Right. He will learn his brain will organize that whole event for him and it will organize it for you. So these mistakes that we always make because we're in a human body, these mistakes that we're always making, we will see them. And because we're in our flow, we're not thinking, we will have the answers automatically come up because of experience that we've previously had or something that we previously learned. We're, we're no extremely young chickadees. We got a lot of information up here, right? Because we've got a lot of years behind us to have developed and achieved that information, right? So it's there. We're not thinking about it. The answers are coming. Next walk, for you and for Shane, both of you will have new ideas to take into that walk. And the more we do this, the more they ingrain themselves into the neural pathways. So it happens automatically. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So the learning is always occurring. It, it must, <clears throat> whether we're intentionally doing it or if we're learning through the state of flow and everything's just happening in and of itself. There's the pattern recognition, crucial for everything that we're doing in flow, pattern recognition. I'm going to start at, Phyllis, you're at the, my left again. I don't know how that happened. Phyllis, I don't know. Tell me how you're going to use pattern recognition. And then this is this is the group flow. Mm -hmm. So everybody focus on her answer and you will have the um, uh, patterns connect to her information. And then you, Julie, will be next. You will have a, a new um, example to be able to use because you you'll have your pattern connecting with her information. So Phyllis has the hard part starting off the cycle. <laughs> so I know. Well, I find with Buddy that he's very uh, repetitious. I mean, he basically does the same thing all the time. Uh, when he's waiting for me to come in the house, that's one of those things where he's just bopping and jumping. And that's a pattern he got into from when he was a very young pup. But as time came by, I decided not to come in the house. If he's going to keep jumping and barking, and part of what he did when I did open the door was he grabbed onto my arm and pulled me in the house. So he's retrieving me, which is okay because he's a retriever, but it's not okay that he's biting and pulling. So I got the idea that he needed something in his mouth. He needed to be able to retrieve and say, oh, look what I've got for you. And so that's where he grabbed his leash. And then he went on to grab a blanket. And the other day I came in and he had two blankets and a leash in his mouth. <laughs> so he had all these things and he's wiggling all over the place saying, aren't I great? And, oh, you're such a good boy. And, you know, I just reward him for being such a calm, you know, put together puppy at that point. <laughs> you know, he's not always like that. But mm -hmm. he... um that pattern of barking when I get near the door was the first thing that I noticed that we had to change. And then other patterns of when he's with the other puppy, like we've got the, the beagle and he starts playing with the beagle and he starts biting him around the neck and he's not being mean or aggressive. He wants to play and he played at your house. So now he wants to play at my house. And I noticed that the more he played with your puppies, the more he wanted to play with the beagle. So all I have to say is easy and then easy on the puppy. And next thing you know, he's got Buddy jumping up at him and he's Buddy and Toby's jumping and they're both together and they're both running around the house and making circles around each other because they're playing. And this is a good pattern for them to get to know each other, the one thing. And the fact that he backed up and went easy you know, okay, I played at Laurie's house. Now I can play here. This works because the beagle wants to play too, but he's smaller. 
So buddy gets really, really gentle just with the word easy. So that pattern of going after the beagle to get him to play was pretty rough in the beginning, but now it's starting to be, okay, let's have a good time. And they run through the house and they hide under the bed and they do this thing together until the beagle has no energy left and he just flops on the floor. So Excellent. Two points that you established patterns so you could mold the behavior you could change the behavior and you could mold the behavior. Mm -hmm. That is because you saw patterns. The pattern with this, he had already been conditioned to the unacceptable beha behavior. So you reconditioned him because your identification with that pattern. And then the new pattern, because I ta taught him to play here with my smaller dog, he can now go home and continue that pattern easy when he's too rough. And now you've got raised mood state instead of the fearful buddy that I first met. Now he's more playful, more joyful, more social. Excellent. Excellent. Because you've recognized the pattern, because you've worked with the patterns extensively. And I stay back from it. I don't get involved in it. I don't touch him. I just sit and say, easy, buddy. Nice. And then, nice. Excellent. So you know, the two of them are having a ball. Yeah, and the okay. beagle loves to play. Now yeah. the little buddy baby gets to play, the little beagle boy. It's yeah. going great. <laughs> good on you. Keep up the good work. Ms. Ms. Julie, can you take the torch? How have you used pattern recognition to help your behavior modification or behavior conditioning? Well, and yeah. You know, there's there's a, no right or wrong. Yeah. There's a, a ton of different instances, but I guess the one that I need the most work on is the obvious one with Carrie. So I'm trying to figure out um, when we're, when, when we're going to go outside for the walk, um, what's the best pattern, what's the best system for Shane, because I haven't quite figured out if I, right now I go out first with Shane on the leash and um, I sort of have I, I tr I either way it bothers him. If I'm out first and I'm like 30 feet away and Carrie comes out, you know, Shane will see him and get all, you know, hyper. Um, but I guess the pattern that I've learned is I start walking forward and I let Carrie catch up with us slowly. We, you know, I've learned slow is better. Um, but as soon as Carrie catches up, you know, Shane is, his head's down, his shackles are up and he starts barking and he's on the leash. Um, but then um, I'm just trying to think this through. Um, I tell Carrie to keep walking and not face him. I've learned that if Carrie faces him and like tries to throw him a treat or something, Shane just freaks out. And it's taken so long for Carrie to let that to sink into his head. He still doesn't like that he has to turn away and keep walking. Um, so I've learned to try to, you know, get Carrie to keep going forward. Um, and we just keep moving. I just feel like I should be doing more, but that's, you know, eventually after like five minutes, Shane stops barking, but it takes him a little while. And then I let him off. And I also have learned, um, I tell Carrie, don't give him the treat if he's barking at you. You have to wait till he stops barking. So, I mean, crucial. Fabulous. Fabulous. And I will help you speed that up when I come over. Okay. You're doing great, though. Excellent. Yes. You're, you're recognizing the patterns. So you can see this, this, this three times is a pattern. This, this, this has occurred. Hmm, let me shift. Instead of doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, right? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. You're, you're progressing. And it's yeah. not about the pace that we want because we always yeah. want it faster than it is. Definitely. Yeah. It's human nature. It's about Shane's pace. And you're, you're listening to his needs. Kudos to you. Observing his patterns and using that to his behavioral advantage. Excellent. Thank you. Ms. Linda. So... Um, the only pattern that came to my mind is just her pattern of not react, not liking new people. So 
we've done a number of things with that is, um, you know, standing between her and the person and having that person just totally ignore her until she feels comfortable. But that's, I guess, her biggest pattern. Um, so tell us how that pattern begins. Tell us about the the uh, pattern body language, because remember, with every emotion, there's a physiological response. So when she thinks, oh, crap, something in her body is showing you what she's thinking. Yeah, so mostly it's when, when she needs meets a new person and they come in the house, really mm -hmm. think she's trying to protect me. And so she will just be out of control barking and go up to that person. So, um, you know, we've, we tried different things, keeping her room or whatever, but now I find if I have her on a leash and I stand between and I can just tell her easy and I'm like, you're okay. Look at me breezy. Everything's good. No threat here. Everything's good. She can calm down. And then if that person ignores her, it's actually gotten to the point where she would actually want to maybe, you know, meet them or whatever. Excellent. And, so you've yeah. learned to break all the details down for fine detailed patterns. You've learned when somebody, the distance is the door. Somebody gets to the door. She does something. What does she do before she becomes reactive? Well, she perks up. And yes, that, that's that. our... You yeah, she does it all day. You know, when anybody is outside, she hears animals. I think we have raccoons or something. She's always at night. I mean, she could be in a dead sleep and she's like alert. And I'm just like easy. And I've been trying the let's uh, let's look. Let's go look. It's like there's nothing out there, Breezy. You're okay. So that pattern of interrupt, and this is that's her drive. That's completely natural for a border terrier to be alerted and want to go chase and kill something. <laughs> you know, and that's the border terrier in her for sure. But you're breaking the habits by breaking down first the behaviors to smart, tiny steps, the details. She alerts. Well, let's give her something to do. She alerted. Now we're going to inject a behavior. Let's see, i.e. curiosity. We've injected right. curiosity. Let's see. She goes up to the window. You guys go up to the window of the door and realize, oh, okay, there isn't anything. I guess I am safe. So she's learning through that pattern to inject curiosity before she freaks out. So the more you do that, the more it will be natural for her to do on her own. Right now, you're co-regulating her by having to say, let's see. And uh, that might happen for a month, a week, a year. doesn't matter. It's, again, her, her time frame. Let's see. Until that curiosity pattern kicks in and she doesn't get as reactive as often. But she's, she's, a, ter she's a border terrier. It's, it's so sometimes good. when we go, let's see, there is somebody walking by the house. Uh -huh. and or another dog and mm -hmm. you know and then we're, I'm like it's just a person it's just a dog and she is able to calm down from that so you've taken it even further you brought her into curiosity you help you're helping her to see something that she wanted initially to react to but now you're teaching her emotion regulation so she comes to the point of curiosity. Hmm, let me see. She comes to the point of wanting to eat them up, but you're teaching her, this is how we regulate. She's going into those new behaviors because of your code regulation. Excellent. Breaking all the details down. The finer we can break these details down, the more control we have to uh, change this behavior. Good on you. Excellent. Thank you. Woo and I'll tell you, when I saw her the, uh, yesterday, oh my gosh, she, you're doing excellent. You're doing excellent work with her. Excellent. Thank you. Thank excellent. you. It's a group effort here. Nice. Thank you. Ms. Rachel, last but not least. Hey.
<laughs> with the little three babies. Each with their own issues. Right. <laughs> But I'll use um, I'll use Ronan with his anxiety. So, um, you know, he has this pattern when we're out and he sees another dog or another person that he literally cries or screams. He sounds like he's being murdered. Um, so I started, for example, the other day, my husband was with me. We had all three. I usually have Reese because I've been working on his pooling. He likes the pool. So. I've been, you know, using the word easy, but I saw a dog coming. I said, Mark, switch with me. Give me Rowie and uh, you take Reese. And he also had Ruby. So I pick Ronan up. This is my pattern when I see the other dog and I rub his chest and I tell him, it's okay. You're safe. You're safe. And those words seem to calm him down and he doesn't scream anymore when we see someone. Woohoo! Oh my God, that's huge. <clears throat> Took me a while to figure it out. I was trying to do it. I was squeezing him between the, my legs. He still felt unsafe. Um, and I was using the word easy. He likes the words, you are safe. You're okay. I got nice. you. Kudos so, to you. So. That's a huge. And then I was able to also do that. I had all three of them by myself, as I often do. Um, and I saw some men workers and I saw all of them starting to get anxious. So I took a different direction, but I kept saying over and over easy. You guys are safe. We're good. And none of them really reacted too much. That's huge. Three baby yeah. Boston's. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. All tied to my waist. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> Good thing they're small. <laughs> yeah. It was you Good can work out. That. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Good on you. Excellent. You guys are doing so well. Fabulous. Do any of you have questions, comments, concerns about your pattern work or anybody else's pattern work? Well, yeah, but I have. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So after she has an incident of like, let's see, and it is a dog and she kind of. Like now she does, she's reactive, but she also does that whining. Like, like she wants to go meet the dog, but is that a good time to then go do meditation again after she's calmed down? You would have to determine that because I would have to feel if that whining is overwhelmed, getting ready to flood, or it's excited and it will be resolved when I go meet that dog. So you yeah. could do one or the other, and both could be right. Both, either one of them could be well, wrong. Thanks a lot, Lori. Okay, You're right, <laughs> right, right. Okay. So I would love it if you um, followed through with one or both of those and told me which one, which pattern you began that was right for your instance. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Julie, you had a question? Come concern? Um, yeah, I just had a, a question. Um, this is a different pattern. I just wanted your suggestion on it. Um, when Carrie comes into the house, like at night when he comes home, um, he comes walking into the kitchen without, and Carrie's a type A, so you feel all this energy come in the front door. And Shane knows immediately. He, pr he pretty much knows when he pulls in the driveway. But so Shane will, you know, run out of the kitchen into my office, his safe area. And then when Carrie comes into the kitchen, Shane will come over to the entrance from my office into the kitchen and stand there and bark. And his bark is, it's annoying. I mean, it's sort of this pitch that, I mean, nobody likes a dog barking at them anyway. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so at least he's not running into his crate every time. Now he's running to the doorway there and barking at Excellent. him. But, but still, so I go over to him and I think you, you said outside, I should, you know, hold his collar and do the easy, easy. Um, but I feel like when I go over to him, he turns from me and wants to run away into mm -hmm. his, towards his crate. Mm -hmm. And um, I just don't feel like I have the system down how I should handle that situation. Right, right, right. It's every night. It's every time Carrie mm -hmm. comes in, it's the same thing. 
So your pattern is telling you that the minute you go do as I suggested, he bolts and there's no product, there's no growth. It doesn't feel it like to a that. point of, yeah, there's growth. He went to the door instead of straight to his pen, but now the growth has stunted because of my suggestion, really, do what you were doing. So as as I always say, my suggestion is the is the springboard. We don't the only what is the only chain? What is the only right suggestion? The right thing to do? Well, it works. <laughs> yes. So let's brainstorm. Everyone here has focused on your uh, uh, your pattern, your challenge. Everyone has been uh, connected to this group uh, scenario. So let's stay in this group scenario and do some troubleshooting because you all have the information. Forget about the details. We're going to do this mastermind right here, right now. Let go of the struggle. We're no more struggle. We have the information. Release. Now, let's throw some ideas out. Let's just go in a flow. There is no wrong in a flow. So the one thing that kept coming to my mind, just the whole situation, I don't know if it would be for this, is has your husband ever... Um, fed him like his meal yeah. yeah like make his meal and say here and then and then leave and like maybe learn that he is a good person because you know he's feeding me like with that you know like he could say while he's barking like get the food put it on the floor and say Shane here's food and then Carrie could leave and Shane would feel safe going out to eat but he would sort of associate with him I don't know I love that idea. Okay. What are anybody have any more suggestions, possibilities? Yeah, I get this uh, when dog box because somebody pulls in the yard. It could be my daughter, and it's usually my daughter. And when Buddy's barking, he doesn't know it's Kimberly. He just knows that a car pulled up. So I open the door and I say, oh, it's Kimberly. And then he gets all excited because it's Kimberly. It's not a stranger. It's not, you know, and then when she comes in the house, he just wiggles all over the place. And, he, you know, you get excited about someone coming home and someone that he really adores. I mean, he gets along with Kimberly just as well as he does with me. And she treats him and takes care of him the way she, you know, watches me take care of him. So he has a positive uh, response when we get excited because she came home. Excellent, excellent. You, you've shown, you've given him a positive, put him in a pattern, mm -hmm. a repetition. Kimberly comes home, you tell him the name. He now knows the name. Thank you, Phyllis, that's that's fabulous. Now we're able to see you've in, injected something positive to get him curious. And now his curiosity led to uh, enjoyment, love, cuddles. Kudos so, cute. so how does that, how do I transfer that to Shane? What you can do is recognize the whole, the big picture. Mm -hmm. The reason I had inter, as had mentioned something is she inter, interjected by providing something positive, a positive name. And just as Linda had mentioned, food dish is a positive interjection. Mm -hmm. So what you could do is bring the detail, tiny detail of this pattern. Okay, in, introduce something positive. You don't know what it is yet. You don't need to. We're just bringing in the, the idea so our brain can organize the details of what to do with this information. Yes, Linda? So when Carrie comes home, are you in the office and the dog and Shane's barking? Or do you go greet Carrie and give him a kiss? Like, are you afraid now to go, like, Maybe if you greeted him like, oh, you're home. I'm so happy you're home. Maybe Shane would see it as a good thing. I don't know. Like, Bring what that doing? information. Just instill it into your head. We don't want to work this information yet. We do want to bring, look at the possibilities. Okay. okay. Something positive. She just mentioned another, an additional positive way. Now, these uh, methods that Linda's mentioning is prior Quite often we have to back up and do pre-training, right? So you're 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 showing um, uh, Shane more often 
your affection for Kiri is what I'm hearing her say. So yeah. keep that in the head, in your head. Don't have to work out the details yet. Your brain's going to okay. do that for you. Rachel, okay. did you have your hand up? I, well, I was going to suggest the same thing to replace it with something positive to get excited when he comes home. Yes. To, yes. That's what I usually do. Like I make a big scene when they're looking out the window and they see something that they think is a fear to them. I try to turn it into, you know, oh, look, look, there's a neighbor. Oh, my goodness. I'm so happy to see him. Good job. That's a good idea. You know, now you have four bits of information. One, two, three, four, one, three bits of information. Now, let's let's step out of the flow and come back into the thinking brain a little bit. We know we need a positive experience before, during, or after, right? He he associates fear with Carrie. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm gleaning is. We have to create a new association with Carrie. You've been working pretty hard at that. So continue doing the work that you're doing. And knowing that at the door, the work that you're doing might not be as, as high of a distraction as the door work. So it sounds like maybe, you give me more details in a moment, maybe... Shane is too close to the door for the work that you're doing. Because the work that I just heard you say you're doing is he's facing away from Shane and giving treats. You know that works. That's a pattern that has been established. So how can you use that training moment into a real life moment in that uh, Carrie's coming to the door? Give us more details to work with. Where is Shane? Where are you? Does Shane have a leash on? Is he coming straight in? Like, a, a, a you know, you mentioned he might be doing straight in. So um, um, Shane is, I let's just, either he, let's just take the instance that he's with me. So we're, say Shane and I are in the kitchen and, um, and we're standing um, on one side of the bar. We're in like an aisle between the bar and the sink. And Carrie comes in from the far end of the house and comes walking into the kitchen. And Shane maybe didn't know he was coming. And all of a sudden, blah. So Shane barks and runs to the door to the doorway that leads to my office. And so now I'm hearing I'm hearing you say right now that he went from zero to a hundred with Carrie. Yes. We know that is not resolvable. We know when the dog is in their primitive brain, i.e. they've broken into reactivity, fearful reactivity, we just have to give the dog what they need, remove from the source. That's that's not a training moment. Okay. You want to back it up. We know when Carrie's coming home, five o'clock, say. Carrie comes home at five o'clock, pretend. We're gonna put the leash on, on Shane at 4.30, 4.45. We're gonna have the leash in our hand for 10, 15 minutes. When we hear Carrie coming up, you are gonna put a cue to it. Papa's home, or he has a word. Carrie coming in the door, you've warned him. Papa's home. Now Carrie's going to come into the door mm -hmm. and you're going to be far enough away from the door and, and enabling Shane to see, oh, this is what Papa home means. Mm -hmm. Now, because you're still far away, Carrie hasn't, you know, come straight into the dog. Mm -hmm. Shane is still comfortable a little apprehensive, a little curious. Okay, this way. Now you take him to a safe place. Do I take him to the safe place um, after Carrie comes in the door? You want he, you want Shane to see Carrie. You want him to see what Papa's okay. home means. Okay. okay. So uh, Carrie has opened the door. Okay, this way. 
He doesn't even have to start walking in. He just has to see Carrie's face. Okay. Opening the door. Okay. So, in essence, what you're doing is backing up the intensity of this jolt into mm. digestible bites for shame. Okay. All right. That all makes sense. But then if I say this way and bring him back into my office and say he goes into the crate, um, then what he's been doing is he doesn't, he used to just stay there for, you know, when Carrie was home for hours, but now he comes out, he'll come out and he'll stand at the, the doorway and bark at him. Oh, 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 oh. So close the door, close the office door. Oh, keep him in here. Okay. For a time being, that's your first step. Of course, okay. we're going to progress from there. This right. is just the first step. But this is, we have to back up that intensity. Volume's way down. Right? Okay. Yeah. And if the door shut doesn't work, you will be, get creative enough to find out. How oh, that'll work. Let him the go. door being shut will work. Yeah. Good. So he needs to feel safe and the door shut seems to do that. But then when, just, do I, when do I start letting him out of the office then? When Carrie's home. However long it takes him to get into himself and realize, okay, I'm safe. Okay. Right. So that could be five. I don't know how long it is because I'm not there. But however long it takes where you think you're going to have to do trial and error. Okay. You're going to make mistakes. And that's what learning is about. You're going to make a mistake. So you're going to have the leash on him. So when you're finding this out, in fact, this is what I would do. I would come back in the office, put the leash on, and then see how far he wants to go. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. You'll yeah. play with That's it. That's what I was thinking. Keep the leash on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, of course, if you're like most, if he's like most dogs, he's going to chew the leash the minute you shut the door because he's nervous and would not. So you might you take it off, put it back on. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. I meant when I'm with him, I'll keep the leash good, on. Good. Yeah. Excellent. So that gives you a lot of power to do. Okay. Going to get you progressing again. And we all do that. We get to a point where, wow, the dog has progressed. Mm -hmm, now we're stuck. That's exactly you knew. I have to change something because it's not working. Three okay. times, it's a pattern. It's not working. Got to have a change. So now you have many ideas to grab from, yeah. to draw from. 